Um, I extend a very, very warm welcome to our International Press Luncheon, Joe Biden's first year, the best days already over. This is what we want to discuss uh, today. Just around almost a year ago, or a little bit more than a year ago, we hosted our first uh, press roundtable as part of the Road to Election Night, uh, covering the US presidential elections live in Berlin um, at, uh, at our town hall, Rotes Rathaus. And since then, we have met several times um, with foreign correspondents um, in Berlin, and we talked about uh, G7, NATO, EU, US summits, we talked about the German Bundestagswahl, and now we are back, um, and we want to talk about Biden and his first year um, in office on the day. And for this, we have a fantastic uh, panel. Um, let me introduce um, our panelists to you. Uh, Cecile Boutelli is the economics and business correspondent of Le Monde um, here, stationed in Germany. Melissa Eddy is the Berlin correspondent of the New York Times. Thanks, thanks for being here. Um, Christoph von Marshall is the chief diplomatic correspondent of the Tagesspiegel. And Bartosz, Bartosz Wilinski of the uh, Gazeta Wiboschka. And I'm always stumbling <laughs> over the pronunciation, although I really practice Bart, um, and I'm sorry about this. Um, he is also Berlin uh, correspondent, deputy editor-in-chief um, of one of Poland's uh, largest daily newspapers. Um, let me quote, um, uh, I think we are having a little bit of a background noise, so I would like to ask everybody again just to um, thank you, this is so much better. So let me just uh, quote very briefly um, from Biden's inauguration address, um, and he said, much to repair, much to restore, much to heal, much to build, and much to gain. So I would like to start with a very brief question to our panelists and asking for a very brief answer. Thinking back one year to the day of the inauguration events, what was most memorable um, to you? And what do you think was so to say, the guiding principle for the last year um, in office. And I would like to start with you, Cecile, your most memorable integration moment. Well, I, I uh, hello, <laughs> sorry. I, I won't uh, give maybe a picture, um, but I would say, uh, I would talk about a feeling. Uh, it was very strong, uh, this feeling of uh, uh, almost recovery, return to normality. So like a big uh, uh, breathing after so, after the, the, the last year's very complicated complicated years where stability was missing um, but there were obviously two remaining shadows the COVID of course and the memory of the capital attack which which, which left, left of course a shock in all democracy of course thank you so much and Melissa hi thank you so much everyone for being here for me it was definitely um, seeing the young poet uh, in her bright yellow coat and red headband give this, you know, as the young woman of color standing on the same Capitol steps that had just been stormed by uh, what we have now come to learn effectively were white supremacists. Uh, I think there was a real feeling of hope in that moment, but there was certainly, I felt a certain sense of whiplash um, that where were we and what had just, happened with looking back um, to the to the storming of the Capitol on the 6th. Thank you so much. Um, Christoph. Yeah, it's a feeling of contrast. Of course, just the day of the inauguration, that's the promise and the re relief America is back, that kind of America uh, we like and cherish. But uh, in deep contrast, uh, the first visit uh, of Biden to Europe and the somewhat lukewarm a reply of President Macron and then Chancellor Angela Merkel. Still, it's Europe is just words, no deeds. And uh, this contrast lasts until today. So this is the, the contrast which makes, uh, which is for me important when I'm looking back to the inauguration and today. 
and Bart, your memorable inauguration moment. Mm. Have You're we... muted. Uh, yeah, no, sorry, I was <laughs> muted. Uh, yeah, guys, uh, just, uh, well, almost everything was said, so everything wise was said, but I'd like to stress out some, uh, well, contrast I have in my mind, because, well, we was delighted to have a change uh, in, uh, in the White House. But in September, uh, well, United States fled from, from Afghanistan. And I, could remember, I can remember this press conference of Joe Biden explaining to the press the reason for, for this uh, withdrawal and uh, well, seeing uh, Joe Biden's, uh, well, observing the consequences of, of this deed. The moment he covered his uh, face uh, in his uh, hands, uh, it was, well, painful. And, uh, well, kind of question, Rose, is, uh, this president able to deliver in the terms of foreign policy? Uh, the question which hasn't been solved. That's my, that's my opinion. Thank you so much. And we come back to the uh, foreign policy part um, in a second. Um, I would like to start a first round where we um, also dig a little bit deeper into the domestic um, agenda of the Biden administration um, and what has been achieved. And Melissa, just before we started, you told uh, me that uh, you stayed up late yesterday. You watched um, you watched Biden's speech and his press conference um, in which he outlined what he has achieved. I think in the press conference, he also said that he was surprised how much opposition and blockage he would be facing. And he was asked um, then, um, didn't you expect that? And he said, um, no, it's actually worse than it was under the uh, Obama administration. Tell us a little bit about his domestic agenda and um, what, what he achieved and, and what he's struggling with. Well, I think um, what was one of the things that was just really interesting is everybody is commenting on how different the press conference yesterday was to those press conferences that were held under Trump. It was also incredibly long. Um, and I think that reflected a certain need that Biden had uh, to really reach out and to try to defend his agenda um, in doing that. This idea uh, that he was so surprised um, to me reflects that at times uh, Biden seems to be still trapped in the past. You know, he has been a senator for so very long. And I think he seems at times to underestimate as do I would say a lot of Americans certainly on the left, um, how hard it is to reunite the country. He had said, you know, when he set out, one of his, his main themes was unity. And we see at the political level, but also, uh, you know, driving around the Midwest, uh, there are still Trump flags that fly from the polls. There's still real clear divisions that remain in society. And I see, you know, we see those reflected as well in the Senate. Uh, and, and, whether Biden will be able to now push through, you know, parts of his big package that has had to be broken down in order to get it through, I think will be the, the real key uh, question for his, for his domestic policy for, for the second half now of, of his term. Um, if I, um, I mean, one, one of the issues um, you talked about was, a, was as a build back better plan, right? The, the big social package. Um, and I remember there, it must have been really painful shortly before Christmas when he got uh, the no from one of his own senators. Um, and now he wants to split it up, right? So is this going to be his um, strategy um, to do small packages and tailor it to what individual Democrats want? That seems to be his way going forward. You know, one of the biggest uh, things that we've seen come out of, of his administration so far is how unbelievably split uh, the Democrats are amongst themselves, where Biden says, you know, oh, I'm a centrist. Well, there's also, you know, quite a strong progressive block. And then we see, you know, an even further centrist block, if you will, uh, that that is, is really putting up uh, real roadblocks to him being able to get his policy through. And his strategy appears to be to try and break it down where he had hoped he could push through one of these big bills, so that's not gonna work, um, build maybe smaller caucuses around individual issues to try to at least enact some of the policy that he initially had set out um, and, and promised to set out. 
which will, you know, already he was asked yesterday, um, you know, what, what do you think your grade will be? And he gives himself a much higher grade than I think many, many voters are giving him. And um, it, you know, it, it's really crucial at this point, I, I think, that, that he be able to get at least part of one of these packages oh. through. Mm. And also to change the narrative, um, I guess. Um, as, as you said, his approval ratings are not that great. And everybody talks about the divide in the Democratic Party, but not so much about the Republican legislative agenda that we come. Uh, oh, yeah. But and that's I mean, even but even Biden himself is not willing to talk about the Republican, you know, legislator agenda. I, it was interesting because yesterday he did kept going back to say they're against everything. What do they stand for? Which is a valid point. But it's not a valid point for most Republicans. You know, to the Republicans, they stand for preventing you, Joe Biden, from ruining the country. And how he overcomes that idea, how he, he convinces these voters who, who are truly convinced that, that Biden is out to destroy the country, uh, changing that narrative with at least enough of them is, is going to be uh, essential. Christoph, the United, I mean, Biden said the United States are back. <laughs> now, one year later, I mean, they were never gone, so to say, but they are certainly back. But back how? And are they a reliable partner, given what we just heard from Melissa? Well, here we are crossing now into the foreign policy. Uh, uh, but for just one, one sentence, I think it's really important to underline that it's not just the Republicans who are undermining the presidency. And it's very easy to make that, so I will not elaborate on that. Everybody knows that big lie and obstruction and so on and so on. But if you see the mistakes of the left wing uh, of the party, uh, which cost them the governorship in Virginia, just not paying attention that parents should have a say in the education. I mean, what, what the Democratic candidates say that uh, Parents shouldn't be heard when it comes to what is taught in schools. Uh, that is just unacceptable for, for the center of America. Also, the now it's pretty clear that the proposal that one has to unfund police is nothing that you can really explain to centr centric, centristic mm -hmm. America. It's, it's, so somehow also the left part, from my point of view, the left wing of the Democratic Party is unwillingly undermining the presidency. But when it comes to your question, who is reliable? That, that's an interesting conundrum where, it, I mean, for from the point of a lot of Germans, there's still this mistrust. What Angela Merkel said in that beer tent uh, a few years ago, somehow we can't rely anymore 100% on America. But now in the Ukraine crisis, you might just turn this question around. Is Germany reliable as a partner when it yeah. comes to the West, in NATO, in sanctions? Um, aren't we part of the problem? Uh, and um, certainly one can't undo this feeling, or Biden hasn't been able to undo this feeling, whether Trump's America well, that is still something there on the horizon and it could come back. And again, America is not reliable in that case. Um, but building up is the second part of the feeling to which degree Europeans are able to act if Trump comes back or a sort of, it's not Trump's a person, it's this kind of uh, Republican America, which says, why should we um, secure the peace uh, in Europe? Why should we pay for the security guarantee? Can't the Europeans do it themselves? So there's very little signs. There are just words that the EU, the Europe as the European Union, understands the message and is willing to step up. But I can't really see that it is happening in a way that the same German citizens, which would say you can't rely on America, would say, well, we can rely on a Europe without NATO. Most Germans rather think that they need the security guarantee. And that is a contradiction here in Germany. Mm -hmm. And we pick up on this uh, certainly later when we also take a look at Russia and the Ukraine. 
Um, Christoph, I want to ask you though, because you started um, with the uh, uh, domestic agenda and, and the political difficulties and you pointed at the uh, problems within the Democratic Party and the, the, the left wings and the mistakes. Biden had been a legislator for decades um, and he prided or prides himself as a bridge builder. How come that he can't get his own party in line? Yeah, I think the fault is on both sides. It's, of course, very easy for the Republicans uh, as a party which has 50 seats uh, in the Senate. Let's not forget that. Um, they feel pretty strong. And as any opposition, obstruction is fair. That's OK. Uh, that is what opposition is um, supposed to do uh, to control and block uh, the government. And so. Uh, I would blame the moderate Republicans that there is so little willingness to work with the non-leftist Democrats. I, I, there would be a majority in the Senate, in the House, uh, for a compromise. But um, mathematically, I'm I'm speaking here. Yeah? Uh, but uh, given this sort of division, and none of the two parties uh, is really trying to do what would be necessary. Because Biden, with respect uh, to the voters, he, he is a moderate Democrat. He wants to cooperate, but he is still, from the point of the view of the Republicans and uh, of many independents, still an overreaching president. Just look at these figures of all these programs. It is more than the whole GDP of one year of the American economy. Of course, it's over several years, but if you are talking about billion dollar programs, not one, three, yeah, that is, that still feeds into the narrative that we have an overreaching state and uh, that Democrats stand for spending too much and relying too little on uh, responsibility of the individual uh, citizens. It is a narrative which is um, here fed by Biden and the Democrats. And probably not just uh, with regard to the spending, but also some other programs like the uh, vaccination mandate, um, where he also had a pretty big reach into uh, states' rights um, and the Supreme Court um, uh, I mean, ruled last week that that is actually not, not legal. Um, now I would like to turn to Cecile. Um, Continuing with the international aspects of Biden's uh, agenda, um, I very much remember late summer, early fall this year with the, should we call it a, a, at least a short-term fallout between the United States um, and France over AUKUS. Tell us a little bit about the, um, the US-French relationship and how it currently looks like. Yeah, of course. Uh, it was uh, the big affair, the big problem, the big disappointment uh, between uh, Paris and New York. Um, the wounds are, not, are still not completely he healed, definitely. Um, this, I mean, this alliance between Great Britain, Australia and the United States was felt to be a betrayal. Uh, we know how badly uh, Macron gets along with Boris Johnson, so it was a very the worst situation possible. And uh, since uh, then, both sides are trying to improve things. Um, for example, in Rome in October, um, Biden recognized uh, in a polit uh, public exchange a clumsy way of doing things, a lack of elegance uh, towards Paris on the on the part uh, on the part of his partner he expressed his great affection for France. So it was a lot of, of warm words. Uh, so it was the, uh, important. Um, uh, it appears that Macron has forgiven Biden better than Johnson, but trust had been badly affected. Um, and uh, I think we, we, sh we should remember it was a real challenge for Macron because it was an affront on, on his cre uh, credibility and his big project for Europe. He's trying to be the great European leader of the post Merkel uh, uh, Europe. And uh, this, uh, this fact 
this affair uh, highlight the limits of this uh, uh, ambition and this positioning of France in the context of growing rivality between the United States and China. He's trying to be the third way between the two, uh, the two uh, great power, and he's trying to be to present himself as a, as a leader, as big one of the big leader of of this uh, of this ambition. That's uh, that's his ambition for the the six now the the, the period of the six first months of 2022 uh, as a president uh, presidency of Europe. Uh, France's president uh, of Europe uh, has a presidency of Europe, and it was a big. Uh, so it was a, the 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 end of the ruin of this ambition um, because he had no credibility at all um, but now that things are quite different uh, i would i would point to uh, i would say two points uh, uh, if i can the first one is uh, the result of german elections and uh, that was a big relief for paris because the result of this election has to be um well a strengthening of of europe of european uh, strategy of this european strategy why because the artisans the people who were making the recovery fund in the finance uh, minister of finance in berlin are now in um in in in, in, uh, in in close to to the chancel um i think for example of uh your cookies who has been working a lot with paris uh, as he told me uh for this recovery fund was very important for paris very important for the debates we are europe uh, economic debates uh so it was a huge uh, uh um yeah relief or uh, in in paris and almost uh, almost, uh, uh, yeah, of a big joy of of, of having uh, and uh, finally per, uh, Berlin and and his and side and, and his side and I think it was, yeah, it was it was better for it. So every, everyone calm himself uh, after that, and um, well, we have to challenge, of course, uh, in Paris where we need. Uh, uh, Macron needs, of course, uh, Washington for the Russian f problem, uh, of course, a Russian issue, and and second one, the the environment, uh, which is very much uh, um, also for uh, for France a big uh, issue. It's very important in the debate in, in France, not only, but but also uh, uh, it was it would be a, it would be an issue for for him uh, in the in the coming election and um, to. I would say to that Macron is, is heading this election with this European stature, the European um, uh, ambition, and it's very important that he feels he feels uh, um, support, and uh, that would be uh, I think the. If he wins, which is pretty much uh, probable, uh, uh, he will he, he could count on this new credibility in Europe and uh, this uh, AUKUS affair, which was uh, uh, he he got credit. Uh, I think uh, uh, in in Washington it could be maybe easier in the in the in the future, but um, maybe not. But uh, I think it could be an interesting uh, uh, consolation. Thank you so much um, and also for, for making the bridge uh, to the European Union um, and to the French-German relationship. Um, you already mentioned Russia and that is something I would like to pick, pick up on. Um, we know that uh, you, um, uh, Blinken is currently uh, in Berlin. Um, we also know this because we are one of the uh, partners who are hosting him later on this afternoon um, for his Berlin speech. Um, he has been in the Ukraine. Uh, the Ukrainian-Russian conflict is something which is very worrisome uh, from the US perspective. Um, Bart, tell us a little bit about um, the US uh, Eastern Europe-Russia policies and where we stand. Uh. <laughs> well, there's a lot of engagement, surprisingly, uh, because, well, with President Trump, uh, I'd say that this engagement would be well put in question. Uh, and Donald Trump, uh, well, he wanted to have uh, NATO, well, uh, disbanded. And that, that could be, well, the, 
the change of, of, of the situation. Hopefully we have uh, Biden who is a well enthusiastic of, of, of transatlantic uh, bonds and uh, he understands that if the Ukraine uh, would become a you know, Russian colony, uh, occupied territory, it could cause uh, well, uh, huge problems, not only to the countries on the eastern flank in terms of security, but uh, for entire uh, European Union could have uh, devastating effects, uh, especially now when all the countries and economies are crippled by by, by COVID pandemics. Uh, let's talk the, the uh, refugees, let's talk the uh, hybrid threats, uh, let's talk uh, uh, energy uh, security as well, the gas pipelines uh, were built uh, in the Ukraine, transporting gas from Russia to uh, Western Europe. There are uh, also other energy uh, connections uh, in the energetic sector. So uh, the war would, would cripple uh, economy in, in the whole Europe. Uh, what I, what I see here uh, is uh, on the one side an attempt of Russia to force, uh, to force Americans uh, to enter in a bilateral dialogue like in what like it was done in Yalta in, in 44. So let's divide Europe, let's define our zones of interest, let's define uh, the new boundaries. Uh, it's well, it has a kind of stench of you know Munich conference uh, to decide uh, on the Ukraine's uh, future without having Ukraine involved in those talk. Uh, this is bad. Uh, the Americans agreed to talk with Russia directly, bilaterally. They discussed it with uh, European partners. Uh, the problem for my country, for me personally, is that I don't see uh, a Polish uh, voice. I don't hear the Polish voice in uh, those uh, in this, this process. Uh, Poland, as you know, is uh, no longer a democratic state. Uh, we have the government, which tends to be more and more authoritarian. Uh, uh, recently, we have learned that uh, the opposition has been, well, um, invigilated uh, by means of uh, Israeli uh, software called Pegasus. So even those fundament, fundamental stuff, fundamental things for democracy uh, has been overturned uh, in, in Poland. And Poland's, uh, well, importance for, well, European Union, for the foreign policy, for the future of European Union also diminished. So uh, Biden is not discussing directly with, uh, uh, with Polish uh, president. He hasn't met him. Uh, there were some, you know, talks between uh, foreign ministers and secretary of state. There are some uh, conversation between uh, National Security uh, Council and Polish Security Council. But still, uh, well, we are lacking of, of bilateral dialogue on, on, on a high level in Poland. And they, uh, the, the, the Washington, well, I have even impression that they ignore uh, Poland because it became authoritarian, authoritarian state. So to summarize, this is good that they engage. The bad thing is they probably talk too much bilaterally with, with Russia. And the extremely bad thing, but this is not the fault of, of Joe Biden, is that the Poland, the, the most important country on the eastern flank, is absent in all those uh, negotiations. But the situation is, is, is still crucial if, uh, if uh, Vladimir Putin decides to give, if he would give an order to, to attack uh, Ukraine, the consequences would be tragic for, for, for the entire continent, not only for the eastern flank. Oh, I can't hear you. Yeah, thank you so yeah, much. Okay. Um, <laughs> I also would like to our audience um, to start thinking about uh, your questions you want to ask to our panelists. You can already write them in the chat function or you um, can raise your hand and then I, uh, I will start in just a few minutes calling on you. Um, I wanted to um, hand over to Christoph um, and Melissa again, um, looking forward to Blinken's speech later today. What do you think he is going to focus on, Christoph? Well, it is, it is announced as the big speech um, about the relationship with Europe. And I think uh, given that he has first his meetings uh, with the foreign minister and the chancellor and afterwards a press statement, of course, in the press statement, his main uh, task is to show that Europe and the US stand together, that there's no split, no conflict uh, about strategy, goals, um, threats, counter threats, sanctions. But the speech gives him a somewhat different opportunity to outline also expectations. So my expectation to the speech is that it will be a little bit a different message from the messages during the press statements, which are very much on 
how Europe and the US stand together. I might be wrong, but I think um, I would elaborate on what I said before. There's not just this question whether America is still willing to be engaged in Europe and is still the guarantee uh, for security and peace in Europe. It is also the question, what is the answer of the European Union to step up and play a bigger part? So that is my expectation, what this speech will be about. Uh, but it is a very tricky uh, thing uh, to not to over challenge Europe because then it will be interpreted or could be interpreted as a sign uh, that Europe and the US are not on the same page. So he has to balance a quite tricky line when he, he will be challenging Europe to do more. And one more point, since I'm the German here, mm -hmm. and uh, it's better that I say that and not our friends in Europe, it is especially a question to Germany. Why is the speech in Germany? Of course, you could just technically explain because at the moment the trip and so on. So on. No, I think it's more. Germany is, nobody probably would challenge that assumption, the big economic and also political power in Europe, the biggest economy. But it is also, that is a charming um, reason why Berlin. And there are two not so charming reasons. And that is that most doubts uh, whether we are on the same page uh, with our European and American uh, friends when it comes to countering Putin. We are the country the most doubts are, um, uh, well, we, we cause the most doubts and we are the big problem when it comes to the question, how do we guarantee energy um, reliance uh, because we have this 50% dependency on Russian gas? It's, it's, that's not Poland, that's not uh, France, that's not Italy. And so somehow, if this goes to confrontation, somehow the question has to be answered Will German houses be cold uh, coming February? Uh, will the industry not get uh, the energy they need to produce? And what will be the cost? And I think that there can be answers. It is also a question of price and a little bit of time because we could do with more liquid gas, which is more expensive. And then of course, um, all the lefties in Germany, ah, this is all about that we have a conflict because America wants to sell American liquid gas instead of Russian. Uh, gas, which is of course not true, but we all know, um, we, we all can, can foresee the debates will be, which will be held, uh, which will be coming. And um, well, I'm looking forward to the speech and um, I'm looking forward whether my assumption, my expectations are correct or not. Um, Melissa, also to you. Um... We heard about gas uh, in Russia and um, as being one of the big topics definitely on the agenda of all the meetings taking place today. What are the other uh, topics you think will be on the agenda today? I think NATO and certainly Germany's commitment to NATO, like shoring up, where does this new government concretely stand? It's something that was obviously discussed a lot under uh, Merkel, but it hasn't come up as much. Uh, well, there hasn't been a lot of time to bring it up yet. Um, with uh, with uh, Schultz's government. And I think that will certainly be one of the key items on the agenda. Bart, what do you think is going to be the main topics today? Well, uh, I'd like to have a kind of reassurance that the transatlantic bond is stable and will be stable uh, no matter who will be the president, the next president of the United States. Uh, because my you know, deepest fear is that the history will repeat and Donald Trump or somebody like him would return to, to, to the power. And we have learned that in Poland, we have learned that in Hungary, that the second term of the populist government, return of them uh, is uh, well far more dangerous than the, 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 the first one because they return to power much smarter, much you know, capable of uh, destructing uh, the democratic system to, to well uh, raising the fundamentals of, of, of democratic states. We have observed that uh, in Poland, for instance, in, during the first term of, of uh, law and justice governments, they had a problem with the constitutional court. Uh, on the second term, uh, they started uh, their rule with, uh, well, disbanding, uh, well, uh, subordinating the, the, the constitutional court. So if Donald Trump would return, he would be much smarter and much effective in his well destructive work. So this is crucial to reassure, uh, well, you, Europeans and Americans that those bonds are important, that those bonds are, you know, untouchable. That's my, my hope and my, my take.
a little bit, you know, well, elevated hopes, but uh, that's what we need in those, you know, tense moments, uh, having a uh, well, tense situation in Ukraine. And Cecile, your expectations for the day? Yeah, I'm, 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 I agree with what was uh, said uh, before. I think it's very important in this time, in this period, to show a common front against the attacks on democracy. And uh, because the, uh, the, the attack of, of Putin uh, is, of course, uh, also an attack of, of, of the, the weakening uh, of uh, democracy. Uh, and uh, it's also in uh, inner policy, in inner politics and in, in, in geopolitics. And uh, I think that's the big uh, message uh, that American has to, 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 to give right now. It's really important. And then having an idea of common defense, so which is uh, no, so no lack of defense. Uh, um, even it's hard in details, but it's, it's, um, it's important to show the, the, the strongness and the willingness to be uh, to defend the democracy. Thank you so much. And with this, um, I will now in, um, include um, our audience. I also want to remind um, our younger um, members and participants that you are also very welcome to ask questions and post comments. Um, so um, the first, um, I will call um, always on three persons and then hand it back um, to our panelists. So the first one um, on our list is, is a good, good Aspen friend, uh, Klaus Wittmann. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you. All the best for the rest of the year. I have a short question, a threefold question to Christoph von Marshall, and it's about judgment on Biden's judgment. Yesterday, he made a remark like uh, a limited incursion into Ukraine would be acceptable, but all out war would cost Russia dearly. Is he not aware that any further step towards tearing up Ukraine is unacceptable, unacceptable, or was it just a slip of the tongue? Then on, on Putin's judgment, a commentator <clears throat> just wrote that he is probably seized by Caesarism. Is he not aware that the West can never consent to re-establishing the Brezhnev doctrine uh, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, which in fact is what he is aiming at? And then thirdly, on German, judgment do you uh, would you uh, also uh, say that there are still too many who are ready to be very forthcoming towards putin putin versteher not in the sense of understanding its motives which of course is necessary but in the sense of condoning his actions thank you uh, so much klaus um that we will come back to this um, and then to Christoph as a German Versteher, as a US Versteher and a Russia Versteher. <laughs> Quite a high tall, uh, call. Um, over to you, Martin, um, another very good friend of the Aspen family. Thank you so much, Stormy. Thank you for doing this and uh, for the opportunity. So uh, we talked about many things on the agenda of um, Joe Biden, uh, which are stuck the infrastructure bill is thought uh, voting rights, um, maybe um, not a breakthrough and um, also the wrong topic. So um, on an international level, uh, Biden has to restore at the same time. So my question uh, to whoever um, wants to jump in on this is, uh, do you see any opportunity of a like, game-changing um, topic um, for his domestic agenda, but also for his international agenda um, that is likely to be realized, likely to be a success, especially before the midterms. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and the next one on our list, um, I think you took down your hand, but um, I'm still calling on you, is Andreas Luko. And I'm checking if I'm seeing Andreas. Yeah, here I am. Yeah, okay. there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have a specific question at the moment, but yeah, all right. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry then I mis misunderstood. Um, yeah, sorry then. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
All right. Um, and we had um, one question in the chat uh, by Evo. Um, and I would like to involve you um, also in our discussion. And uh, can I give you the floor? Sure. No problem. Thanks a lot. I didn't want to take every, everybody's time that much. Uh, this is why I prefer to put it in a chat room. Um, well, the question is basically, is there an interconnection? I think in uh, yesterday's uh, press uh, speech, Biden also indicated or was asked a little bit uh, as to what, what implication it might have. But I'm uh, very much aware of the issue being uh, discussed currently as a worst case scenario among uh, UN representatives in New York, I think it was recalled by press representatives on BBC or was it CNN, that potentially there may be an interconnection between the Taiwan case that China is proposing or would like to push forward on uh, and, and the Ukraine crisis uh, as to whether or not uh, what superpower is watching, uh, what precedent may uh, have, what result and potentially how, how they may address and assess that further pushes uh, forward into their specific uh, security issue that they may have. Uh, and perhaps potentially as I have raised in the past, this, uh, it's, it's only a historic issue, but uh, may there be a scenario to what um, Biden may be preparing for potentially, I'm not aware because I am lacking of course, uh, any confidential information of the agencies or so forth as to whether or not there may be in place potentially a continental Asian um, see, well, put it that way, protocol similar potentially to the Ribbentrop uh, Molotov uh, uh, protocol uh, presiding the Second World War, actually, and that may divide uh, Asia into spheres of influence, uh, hegemonial wise. Um, that would, of course, confront uh, all of the superpowers and, and, and us as Germans and, and all of the Western world and Japanese as well, of course, uh, Taiwanese, uh, you name it. Thanks. Thank you so much um, also for broadening the already <laughs> very wide coverage uh, we are doing, um, leading us uh, from Russia um, further east um, to Asia and the conflicts there. I hand over to Christoph first. Thank you. Well, the three questions of judgment uh, to Biden, I think it was a slip of tongue. I don't think that it was wise to, um, to signal that a small uh, incursion would be tolerated. Um, you can't that say in public. Um, I understand it uh, to a certain degree, but I think still it's unwise because it is, it is, he tries to calm the public. We are not talking of an all out war. And of course that is important to say, and that's a difference to 1938, if somebody wants to make it all these draws this, uh, this parallels. Um, if there is war, it will be a regionally, um, uh, a regional war in parts of Ukraine. We are not talking about a European war uh, or even, even bigger. Uh, one can signal that, but I wouldn't say, I, I don't uh, judge it wise that uh, Biden said, uh, well, what Biden said. Uh, Putin, that is a big question. I mean, you can draw from what he has done so far, very contradictory consequences. Uh, some people say, well, he has promised so much. He has uh, made so much pressure. He can't just walk away. Of course he can. He did it a year ago. We had the same situation in January, February, a year ago with maybe not 100,000, but 80 or 90,000 Russian troops at the borders. And in March, he decided to, to turn away. Uh, so why, why wouldn't it be possible that he does it again? Of course, uh, but it's of, of course also possible that it's just a mis misjudgment because we had this Putin speeches in, in summer uh, where he claims uh, that um, the Soviet imperial sphere has to be restored. And I take that seriously, but uh, I wouldn't say that one can make today a 100% conclusion what is on uh, Putin's mind. And maybe he hasn't had yet made up his mind and is still juggling uh, his options, what he can do. And this depends to a huge degree on the response and the signals uh, from the West. And, uh, and the last thing, uh, Germany to force coming to Putin. I don't think that the majority of Germans want to be forced coming to Putin. It is rather this, this German reaction. We want to live in peace. Uh, we want to be uh, let alone with our relative economic success and this sort of stability. It is 
a lack of willingness to confront reality and the reality is of 2022 is a different reality than the pre-2014 uh, reality or the even the pre-2007 reality when Putin uh, changed in at, with the speech at the Munich conference from cooperation to confrontation. Since 2007, the Russian signals are clear. We don't play according to your rules. And now I say my own interpretation because we know if we play to this established rules, we will lose. We have no soft power. We are not attractive. The only thing which we can do is play with the fear of Russia and we don't want to be liked. We only want to be feared. And if that helps us, um, then we will uh, try this card. But Russia is not even 3% of the global economy. I mean, if, if you think it through, what is on Putin's mind? Is there any chance that he can reestablish this sphere of influence? Of course not. How can Ukrainians say in 10 years from now, whatever he does, whether there's war or not, how can one expect that in 10 years from now, a majority of the Ukrainians will say, well, we live and cooperate with Russia because that is our best choice. It is just not achievable. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't pay too much attention to that. I would rather stick uh, with our values and um, our principles. And there is no rolling back to a world with fears of uh, influence. That is the Yalta world. It is not the post-1989 world. And there is no reason to give in. Cecile, you are nodding. Um, you agree with Christoph? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's it's really important to to underline uh, the uh, that we have to fight this idea of of having a world divided in in uh, in uh, intention in in violence. Uh, um, it's not over. So we see a, a wave of uh, deglobalization, uh, but it's uh, it's uh, it's not the right way, and it's not. Um, it's also not credible because uh, people are uh, moving, people are uh, going from one country to another. Uh, we know the importance of science uh, and on cooperation and there's no way back, I think, uh, to this uh, pre-89 uh, uh, <laughs> pre, uh, yeah, uh, world. Uh, I think really so uh, many people are thinking international and uh, the idea of, of moving, moving back to the this all um, how many division like Stalin yeah uh, so the, the power and influence in, in, in military uh, terms uh, uh, we should really fight this idea and say it's not it's not um, it's outdated, it's not efficient, it has no uh, future and it's not efficient, efficient for the, 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 the future. Um, I, the, of course, the first reason of it, it's, it's uh, the global warming that we have to fight together. So it's really, uh, I would pretty much say we have to support uh, the idea of, of, of a globaliz a growing globalization, even with different levels and even and, 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 and com complicated uh, 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 yeah, and, and challenge uh, to this, uh, this, to this uh, um, uh, go or idea, but it's still very. Uh, we have we have to defend it. I think, yeah. Thank you so much, um, Melissa. Maybe you could also pick up the question on on Asia, China, China, and the Taiwan question. I have to say, I am not at all an Asia expert, and unfortunately, I cannot help you on that one. It's it's an excellent question, and I'm sorry that that uh, as you say so eloquently in German, I am over asked. No, but that is, that, I mean, you, you don't have to answer everything. Um, is, is, uh, was there another um, part of any of the other questions you would like to come in? Well, I think the game changer question uh, is the one I was thinking about, which is really quite interesting, because if you look historically at the United States, um, you know, a crisis tends to be a game changer because uh, it tends to bring Americans together and everybody rallies around. Uh, the president, uh, traditionally then, we saw it, for example, after September 11 attacks. Um, 
back in 2001, where suddenly George Bush uh, was able to, to move easily into, into a second term. Uh, but the, the situation is so different now. We are in the middle of a crisis. There are nearly you know, a million Americans who have died from, from COVID. And there are still deep, deep divisions, both politically and in society over how to handle that. Um, would an outward crisis uh, like, you know, something either in Asia with, with dealing with Taiwan or certainly in Europe um, change that? Um, I'm not even sure about that. If we think of like Bosnia, um, you know, that, that wasn't a, a rallying point. I think it de depends on the scale. Uh, but at this moment, uh, I don't see a, a, an, an obvious game changer. The only one maybe would be if uh, former President Trump is, is prosecuted and, and brought before court. Uh, that could be a game changer. I'm not quite sure in which direction or what the outcome would be, but it, it could certainly shake things up because it would rattle the current political status quo that, that we are in right now um, in, in sort of the, the post-Trump environment. Thank you so much. Uh, Bart, before I hand over to you, um, I want to bring in um, one of our younger participants. Um, uh, Moritz is currently doing an, in, uh, an internship with us um, just in his uh, second week here at ESP. And uh, Moritz, you wanted to ask a question. Yes, thank you, Stormy. I hope you hear me. Um, I wanted to come back to domestic, but also staying in international issues and asking, um, so Biden adhered again to the Paris Agreement, but with the blockage of his um, social package and looking also at COP26, uh, it seems like climate remains a side issue for the US. Um, so do you think, whomever, um, is the US too involved in other challenges, both domestically and internationally, to really leap climate policy? Or is that maybe an issue that could become bigger in the next years? Thank you so much, Moritz. Um, Bart, I hand over to you um, for the foreign policy issues, and then we pick up uh, the climate issues in the last round. Bart. Yeah. I I just like to a little bit polemize with, with Christopher uh, and his assumption that Russia is acting rationally. Well, I don't think this is the case. And for years of the existence of the Soviet Union, the Soviets were compared to Klingons uh, from Star Trek. So while uh, civilization uses different schemes of thinking, of planning and, and doing uh, their projects. And it looks like that they're still Klingons. Uh, and uh, if Russia would have acted uh, rationally, uh, that what they would do in, well, during first uh, put in terms uh, would be there to, well, to develop the, the, the partnership with, with, uh, with, uh, with Europe, to modernize the country, to create a modern rule of law style uh, country, which is able to be, well, uh, to, to, to solve the problems, to be sustainable, to have a strong uh, society. Uh, if Russia would act rationally, they would develop a better economy, not the economy based on oil, on, on, on the sales of oil, oil and, and gas. They would invest in, uh, well, better energy saving uh, structures. Uh, they are just, well, Christopher was right, saying that they want uh, what to, to, to fear uh, of Russia and uh, they could try to test it in, in, in the real game. Uh, this is not an uh, impossible scenario. I believe that this situation in Ukraine, as it was a uh, year, year before, this is a test. Uh, this is a test for unity of Europeans. This is a test of the unity of, of transatlantic uh, bonds. This is a test to, well, make life more harder for, for, for Joe Biden. Uh, Russians, they do believe that this is the old grandpa uh, incapable of, of uh, well, being the, the, the leader of, of uh, super superpower. So they want to, well, make him uh, really suffer uh, dealing with all those conflicts. And let's remember that it happens after the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So this is another point I'd like to make. But this is a chance for Europeans. Uh, we can't forget it. This is a chance to, uh, to show Russia that we are united, that there will be no disputes of a possible sanction regime, of abandoning Ukraine. Uh, there is no place for well, acting Putin for like there, like it was in 2014, 2015 in Germany. Uh, this is a chance for unity and for strong, uh, for, for resolve and for, for strong response. And uh, the Europeans probably that could be the last uh, 
decided that this could be a decisive moment for that because, well, in a few years, we could have another Donald Trump in Washington. So we also need to think about uh, European autonomy in uh, global politics. And we, we really can't, can't lose it. Uh, can't lose it. This, this is also important for countries on the Easter flank, for all democracies like France, Germany. Uh, simply, this is a fight. Putin giving, is giving us an opportunity and, uh, and uh, we can't uh, not, not use it properly. That's my point. Thank you so much, uh, Bart. Melissa, could you say uh, something on climate? Sure. Um, I think it's an excellent question because I think right now we're in a really crucial phase. Um, you know, the blocking of the Build Back Better bill by the senator from West Virginia, it was highly symbolic because West Virginia is traditionally one of the deepest coal states um, in the United States. And therefore, um, that, that was, you know, I think sort of a doomsday prospect. Um, at the same time, there have been, you know, tailpipe emissions, hydrocarbons, there has been some legislation that has um, been pushed through, there is progress being made, it is maybe not as big or as large um, as, as would be hoped for and certainly as would be needed. Um, at the same time, the one thing I think is interesting and maybe not as obvious um, is that there's a growing shift uh, amongst people whose uh, houses are burning. You know, over Christmas, I was in the States and, and Colorado was on fire and like that was just unheard of. And I think the reality of climate change is finally starting to seep down into the American mindset in a way that in Germany, it has been here for decades. And it, it is almost, Germans can barely conceive how actually ignorant a wide, wide essential swath of America is to that. And that is starting to change. And it is the one reason why I would say, I think, uh, it will probably take longer because as we see politically, uh, the politicians are not there yet, but uh, society is catching up. And at the state level, there's also some legislation that is catching up. So it may not be as far reaching and as fast as uh, you know, climate activists would want or it necessarily should be, uh, but we are certainly back. We are, we're on the path and I would say we're on the right path, um, which is, at, something compared to where we were, you know, four years ago. Thank you so much, Melissa. Unfortunately, we have to come to an end. And as it, as it has become tradition, we start with a short round, we end with a short round. Um, and Christoph, you turned one of my questions around asking about the partners of the United States. And that's uh, what I would like to do for the last round. What can our respective countries offer um, for a better partnership. Um, and then in the very last comment by Melissa, I would be asking, would that be enough? So Christoph, what can Germany offer? Well, just being a little bit uh, clearer um, about the sanctions. I think we are still in the very much in the reacting mode that uh, the German reaction is, Oh, we hope it never comes to the point that we have to declare uh, what we are really willing to do or not. And um, it would be just better to be proactive and signal uh, that um, we are part of the West. We are part of the guarantees uh, for independent countries. And there is no turning back to these spheres of influence that, and uh, then a correction of energy policy, of course. Thank you so much, Christoph. Cecile, what can France offer? Well, it uh, can offer a hand and uh, the, the, the perspective that uh, the, the goals, uh, there are many goals that uh, are in common. I would say the, the defense, uh, the defense and, and the, the, also the defense of democracy. And the second one, um, well, the, 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 the defense of, of, of uh, climate and, uh, and the support for this, uh, this uh, fight against global warming. So we have common interests, uh, which are very important and uh, we, we can build on that uh, definitely and of course France expect also can uh, can uh, have some pressure uh, can put some pressure on Berlin and uh, insist on on, on the on the, <laughs> on the fact that uh, Berlin has to be clear and uh, transparent about his pri uh, priorities as it has been said 
Thank you so much. Bart, what can Poland offer? Well, the, its experience of the country that was uh, fighting for freedom, uh, freedom from, you know, uh, slavery uh, in Nazi times and the freedom in, well, liberating themselves from, from populists because now the opposition, democratic opposition is getting uh, again in, in the polls. So the, the, the first is the uh, freedom hunger. And the second one is uh, knowledge on, on the East, on Russia and Soviet Union. We know them pretty well and there will be confrontation. So we could offer that. Uh, we know the enemy. Thank you so much. Melissa, would that be enough? Um, I, the thing that I think is that like Poland, Germany, and France as three of the largest, most important players in Europe, what they could offer is you're a strong European unity, like getting themselves together so that it is a European partner, not Germany, Poland, France. Um, would it be enough? It would certainly be a great start. Thank you so much. And that is a great end of our, um, international press luncheon. It has been a blast as always. Thank you so much to Melissa, Cecile, Bart and Christoph. You probably saw the sun is out in Berlin almost blindingly so, at least in my office. I hope this is a good sign for all the meetings taking place today. Um, stay tuned. Uh, later on, we are going to uh, um, uh, live stream Lincoln's speech. Um, I'm looking forward to reading um, the interpretations um, in your respective newspapers. Thank you so much for being here today. Also, thank you so much to our participants for the questions, um, the discussion, and I hope to see you soon again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.